Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I wish now to continue our reading and discussion of the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Last time we ended with our discussion about the coercive power, the power to force unity into the Roman Catholic Church, the coercive power of the Pope as the King of Kings... The Pope, to maintain that status, must have coercive power. If he is to rule this world as Christ's representative and as Christ's replacement on the earth, as he supposes, he must have coercive power in order to force human beings to conform to his will. And he also puts a a carrot and the stick If, taking the carrot, if you wish to share in his infallibility, then you must obey mindlessly everything he says. The Pope claims infallibility. There in him is no error. And if you wish to share in that infallibility, if you wish to be perfect, You must believe him and submit to him both in will and in deed. And that's the prerogative, the self-arrogated prerogative of the papacy. And this coercive power, this temporal power, this kingly power of the Pope is what drives the ecumenical movement. Unity, to force unity with the Roman Catholic Church. It's the, it's the Roman Catholic Church's way of saying the Protestant Reformation was an error and that we don't have the right to reason in the Scriptures, that we only have the right to obey the Pope. So check your brain and your Bible and your conscience and the leading of the teaching of the Holy Spirit at the door. Just come in, sit down, and do and believe and think what you're told. That is where the ecumenical movement finally leads. Now, we're going to back up a paragraph or two for continuity purposes this morning, beginning about, well, the first full paragraph on page 154 of the book, about a third of the way down the page. He says, and this is a quote, Unity with the Roman faith is absolutely necessary, and therefore the prerogative of absolute infallibility is to be ascribed to it, and a coercive power, a coercive power to constrain to unity of faith, in like manner, absolute, as also the infallibility and coercive power of the Roman Catholic Church itself, which is bound to adhere to the faith, are absolute. Unquote. Now, this was a quote from this so-called uh, Archbishop Manning of the Roman Catholic Church interpreting and expounding upon the encyclical of Pope Pius IX that accompanied the Syllabus of Error of 1864. He's plainly saying that the unity of the Roman Catholic Church is absolutely necessary. Unity with the Roman Catholic faith is absolutely necessary for every man, woman, and child. If you're going to be in the quote-unquote body of Christ, you must have full unity with the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, you must be Catholic. Now, you may call yourself Presbyterian, Baptist, or any other sect of the Protestant world, but you must, in order to be Christian you must have full unity with the Roman Catholic faith because it is the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church, the successor of Peter, and uh, Christ bestowed upon Peter the right to rule in God's stead, in Jesus' stead. That's That's the thinking of the papacy, and we've talked about it ever since we began reading this book. The papacy expounds upon this. The papacy is never going to relinquish its divine right to rule. 
and it says unity with the Roman Catholic faith is absolutely necessary, and therefore the prerogative of absolute infallibility is to be ascribed to it, and a coercive power to constrain to unity. In other words, we may use force to force you to unite with the Roman Catholic Church, in like manner, is absolute. Nobody can take the coercive power away from the Pope. And it says, as also the infallibility and coercive power of the Roman Catholic Church, which is bound to adhere to the faith, are absolute. Okay, the Pope has divine right power, which no one can take away from him, to coerce or force unity with the Roman Catholic Church. That's the ecumenical movement. That is the, the thesis behind the ecumenical movement today. There's no more diabolical uh, attack upon true biblical Protestantism, the true faith of Jesus Christ, than this mentality expressed by Cardinal Manning in his interpretation of the encyclical of Pope Pius IX. And the papacy still holds to this belief that the Pope is infallible, he is both king and priest, no higher king, no higher priest exists on the planet, that he sits in the throne of God Almighty on earth, and he may use coercive power to, to force unity into the Roman Catholic Church. I wonder, I wonder how many of my listeners actually comprehend as, as plain language as this is. I wonder how many of my listeners actually comprehend that this is a dynamic power on the earth. That if we were to expound upon the means by which we are all being forced into unity with the Roman Catholic Church, I'm afraid all of our time would be eaten up by it. And if someone may ask me, well, well, Tom, how is the Roman Catholic Church forcing us to become Catholic? By the civil laws of the land. If you don't, if you don't obey the laws of the land, you go to jail, don't you? Well, how many of us are in jail for challenging the law or violating the law? Well, none of us. What does that mean, Tom? It simply means we're all compliant with the forced unity of the Roman Catholic Church. A mature understanding of what we've been talking about in this book is that our government is the agency through which the papacy brings us all into unity with the Roman Catholic Church. Our entire legal system, our entire educational system, our entire legislative system, ju uh, judicial system, banking, social security, all of it, little by little, every department of our government, little by little, forces us by law, by constraint, by coercion, to come into compliance and unity with the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. Now you say, Tom, that's absurd. Well, I only suggest that it's absurd because you haven't looked into it. R.W. Thompson looked into it. And so we'll continue to read and discuss his book. Now he says, Bellarini, it will be observed, placed this coercive power, which is simply the power to employ force in the church as pertaining to its plan of organization. Pope Pius IX does the same thing in the syllabus. But as according to the decree of infallibility, the Pope absorbs in himself alone all the authority of the Church, 
as a personal privilege, a quote-unquote personal privilege. Archbishop Manning reconciles the apparent difficulty by declaring, quote, This infallibility and coercive power are to be ascribed to him, that is, the Pope, and are personal, unquote. In other words, it's all vested in the Pope. All of this coercive power, though it is applied by the government, this coercive power comes from the breast of the Pope. Another attestation that the state, that the, our, let me just put it plainly, our federal government and even our state governments are the agencies through which this coercive power is exercised. Now he says, hence, we have this logical and inevitable result that when the Pope alone, without any aid from councils or cardinals or bishops, shall decree that a resort to force is necessary to secure, quote, unity with the Catholic faith, unquote, or to get rid of anything or any government, constitution, or law which prevents or retards that unity, he acts infallibly in the place of God, and all the faithful are bound to obedience in the language of the Catholic world to, quote, unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and will. So that's what this coercive power result in. The complete unquestioning submission and obedience of both the intellect and the will of the human being. Every man, woman, and child Unquestioning submission. Well, if the law says, I mean, the government is instituted by God, isn't it? Well, if the government passes a law, then it's our duty as good, faithful Christians to obey that law, right? Trouble is, we forget to read the Scriptures. The prerogative of government, according to the Scriptures, is to reward good and punish evil. The trouble is we get mixed up about what is good and what is evil. What is good is what God says is good. What is evil is what God says is evil in the Scriptures. And it doesn't matter a whit what the Pope says. As a matter of fact, if you take papal influence out of the equation, and our governments were allowed to spring from the truth as written in the Scriptures, it would have no more power than God authorized the, the, the civil power, and that is to reward good as God defines it, and to reward evil, to punish evil as God defines it. But our governments don't see God as God. They don't see the Scriptures as the Word of God. They see whatever the Pope says as the Word of God. And he rewards evil and punishes good. So saith the Scriptures, and so says history. Now, if this country, if this federal and state governments of the, of the states of this country were ever godly, and they truly rewarded good as God defines it, and punished evil as God defines it, those days are long gone. And it's time for us to look objectively and scripturally at the laws of our states and the laws of our federal government and find out what authority they upon what authority are they based? Are they based upon the divine revealed law of God, or are they based on Roman Catholic canon law? They're not one and the same. They're diametrically opposed to one another. One gives glory to God. The other gives glory and power to the Pope. 
And that's what this book is all about. The author continues, he says, And it is only by rendering this obedience that the body of the church becomes as infallible as the head. For it seems to be possessed of such dif uh, diffusing qualities that it may be made to permeate the entire membership. What do you see in this? What do you see in this sentence that he just that I just read? Let me let me read it again. And it is only by rendering this obedience, that is, unquestioning submission. It is only by rendering unquestioning submission to the Pope, that the body of the church becomes infallible as the head. You want to be infallible, says the Pope? Just render unquestioning submission to me, and you'll be perfect. You'll be infallible, just as I am infallible. For it seems to be possessed of such diffusive qualities. In other words, this infallibility can spread. It can be contagious. And you can be infected with this infallibility if you just render to me unthinking submission. And then my infallibility will impermeate the entire Christian world. Isn't that diabolical? Isn't that what Christ wants us to do with Him? To obey Him unquestioningly? But the Pope arrogates that prerogative to Himself and promises that if you just bow down and worship Me, then your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing both good and evil, as the Pope defines it. You see how Satan has used the papacy? It truly is antichrist. The author continues, he says, both, that is the Pope and the body of Christ, Catholics, if they submit passive obedience, unthinking, unquestioning obedience to the Pope, then both are infallible. That is, the head and body, says Archbishop Manning. The one actively in teaching, that is the papacy, the other personally in believing. That's you and me. He gives the reason, quote, because its head can never err, it as a body can never err. Just as the Pope can never err, if you obey him, you can never err. You ever see, you ever notice any Roman Catholic, I mean, pay particular attention. You ever run across somebody and say like in city council or even the school board, that dominates the board? Just every time he opens his mouth, everybody just gazes with amazement at this man or this woman. Find out what religion they are. Many times this arrogance is displayed by Roman Catholics who adhere to this teaching that if they obey the Pope unthinkingly, they also have his infallibility. And they speak as though they are infallible. And, it's, and their wisdom slides off their tongue so slickly that it impresses people. And they say, well, that really sounded good. It must be right. And it's by this subtle arrogance that they control everybody else on the board, everybody else on the city council, everybody else in the church. 
have a, have a particular, just do your own experiment sometime. When you come across somebody that is so influential, find out what religion he is. I'll bet you'll be surprised at how many of them are Roman Catholic. They believe they're infallible because they acquiesce unthinkingly to the authority and supremacy and infallibility of the Pope. And by logic, if they acquiesce in thought, will, and deed to the papacy, then they too are infallible. And that they should control whatever organizational body that they belong to. And they seek to control every body of organizers they can that's their duty as Roman Catholics. As infallible Roman Catholics, they are to be the leaders in every organization from top to bottom. Now, it doesn't matter to them what's true. It's what they believe. Do your own experiment sometime. Now, he gives the reasons because the head can never err. It, as a body, can never err. In other words, the body of Christ, the body of Roman Catholics, rather, can never err if they obey unquestioningly the Pope. And he says, and because the Pope can not exercise, quote, an infallible office fallibly, Therefore, he cannot err in the selection of the means of its exercise, no matter what those means may be, either peaceful or coercive. No, the words, if he decides to call a crusade to, her to extirpate and annihilate the heretics, I mean, it's only because they didn't submit unquestioningly. They could have converted to the Roman Catholic Church peaceably, they could have been just as infallible as you and me. We gave them every opportunity, but they didn't. They, would, they refused. And the only option left now for this infallible papacy is to use force. The flame and the faggot, the guillotine, the rack, the waterboard. Just read Fox's Book of Martyrs and see how the papacy has historically used coercion. And it even used or implemented its inquisition upon God's people by the civil power. You see, those who defied the papacy, they were tried by a, a, a circuit of priests but then they were handed over to the civil power for execution. Yes, they uh, reward good and punish evil. And they punish God's people. God's Bible-believing people. If you're in love with your federal and state governments, maybe it's time we take a look at them from a historical point of view. From a historical point of view. From a New World Order point of view, from a papacy point of view. Find out where the root and basis of all its power and authority comes from and how it exercises that power. Look at our government from a different point of view. And it says, and because the Pope cannot exercise, quote, an infallible office fallibly, unquote, therefore, he cannot err in the selection of the means of its exercise. The exercise of his infallibility may be enforced by whatever means the Pope selects. That is, no matter what those means may be, whether peaceful or coercive, the Pope just simply decides how he's going to deal with the exercise of his infallibility. If he is opposed, he can decide whether to uh, deal with that opposition peacefully or coercively. 
and nobody may question his motive or his means. Hence, the same result as before is reached, that whenever he shall determine that the best, quote-unquote, means of bringing about, quote-unquote, unity with the Catholic faith throughout the world, or any part of it, by employing coercive power, that is, war-making power, inquisitorial power, power exerted upon the people by the civil governments, such a decision becomes absolute truth, about which no doubt can or will be allowed. The act of deciding on his part is infallible, and the body of the church, by passive obedience, becomes also infallible. In other words, if the Pope says, extirpate the Bible believers out of your realm, every Roman Catholic shares in the Pope's infallibility when they carry out that infallible order. And when they kill you, they think they do God's service. Instead, they're doing Antichrist service. Now, to deny this papal infallibility, quote, after the definition is heresy, unquote, and to deny it before is, quote, proximate to heresy, unquote. So... <laughs> If you disagree with the Pope, if you disobey the Pope, you're a heretic. And, of course, we all know, those of us who uh, understand what uh, the Council of Trent said, if you're a heretic, you're to be extirpated and annihilated. You are ex ipso facto excommunicated from the quote-unquote church. You are damned in this life and the life to come. And it is no crime in the Roman Catholic Church to kill a quote-unquote heretic. The trouble is, they always choose God's people to declare heretics. Now, of course, such infallibility as this must be absolute. It is declared to be so, quote, inasmuch as it can be circumscri circumscribed, that is, questioned, by no human or ecclesiastical law. Unquote. Therefore, it is above all law or constitutions, so that when exercised by the Pope, all these may be trampled underfoot. All laws and all constitutions and all governments may be trampled underfoot by the Pope in his exercise of his office as infallible King of Kings and Lord of Lords, if he shall so decree. It will not allow any appeal to history. In other words, you can't read Fox's Book of Martyrs and come to another conclusion than the Pope gives. He says, I am King of Kings, I am Lord of Lords, I am the successor of Peter, I am Christ on earth, and every word out of my mouth is infallible. It must be believed and adhered to both in practice and in will. And if you choose to read a history book that says otherwise, like Fox's books of martyrs, and you bring a charge against the papacy, well, history is no authority over the Pope. It says it will not allow any appeal to history in order that it may be required, uh, inquired whether it is or is not consistent with the teachings of Christ or of his immediate disciples, or of the apostolic fathers of the early church. In other words, you can't take what the papacy teaches today and appeal to the scriptures, the best history book on the planet, to find controversy. You can't appeal to history. You can't appeal to Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Roman Catholic Church says it's the, the Church of Peace. Well, you can't argue by looking back in a good history book like Fox's Book of Martyrs to make a charge against the papacy. Well, you're not the Church of Peace. You're the Church of Antichrist. 
No, you can't do that. You can't appeal to history. You can't even appeal to this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson, was written in 1876. You can't throw this book in the Pope's face. He's God on earth. So you have to take one day at a time, and you have to take it how the, how the papacy dishes it out to you. And you have to accept that it's true. Unquestioning obedience. The, uh, this book says, History is a wilderness into which it will allow none to wander without a guide of its own appointment. And it denies to every man the right to exercise his own, quote-unquote, reason or common sense in separating the true from the false. No, you can't use a history book to come to the truth if that truth differs from what the Pope says. Quote, if anyone say, continues the learned Archbishop Manning, that there is no judge but right reason or common sense, he is only producing in history what Martin Luther applied to the Bible, unquote. And what was that in the Roman Catholic Church's eyes? What did Luther apply to the Bible? Common sense and reason. That's right. He reasoned in the Scriptures, just like Christ and the apostles did. And he came to a different conclusion than the Pope did. So if you are going to use reason and common sense as your guide, then you're merely committing the same heresy that Martin Luther did. You see the logic in this? He says again, quote, In Catholics, such a theory is simple heresy. Why? He answers thus, quote, the only source of revealed truth is God. The only channel of his revelation is the church. No human history can declare what is contained in that revelation. The church, that is the Pope, alone can determine its limits and therefore its contents. Unquote. And when the Pope acting for the church does determine what are its limits and contents, quote, no difficulties of human history can prevail against it, unquote. You can't throw history up in the Pope's face as an accusation. The church is, quote, the city seated on a hill, unquote. It, quote, is its own evidence, anterior to its history and independent of it. Its history is to be learned of itself. You ever hear the expression that history is always written by the victors in war? That statement applies no better to any other institution in history than the papacy. When you pick up a history book, it was written by the papacy. Unless, of course, it was written by a heretic like R.W. Thompson. And so many of the other books that we read here on Inquisition Update. The history books in your public schools are devoid of any of this information. Because Rome writes the history books. Their Jesuit universities, their Jesuit priests, are the authorities of history, and they are the ones who review the history books that wind up on the public school board, uh, the public schools, library shelves, and they strip everything truthful about the Roman Catholic Church from them, so that you can never come to the truth, the knowledge of Roman Catholic Church history. Why? Because the Pope says you can't throw history up in the face of the Pope. There can't be anything incriminating of the Roman Catholic Church in a public school history book. Otherwise, 
someone might violate the Pope's rule and throw a history book up in the face of the Pope and say, what about this? So your school boards are run by those who are very, very sensitive to make sure that no book arises on the shelves of the school book library, the school book repositories, that has one shred of this truth in it. Because we're headed for a new world order. We can't have another Protestant Reformation in this country. We can't have anybody questioning the Pope. The system we developed in this country is so perfect, so after the Roman model. We can't, we're so close to our new world order, we can't have anybody upsetting the apple cart. We can't give the heretics a legitimate reason to question the infallible Pope. What if there was another Protestant Reformation we had to start all over again? History cannot be appealed to. No, the Pope writes the history. And if any heretic like Tom Fress stands up and says, What about this? The Pope just denounces him as a heretic. Persecution takes place. His voice is silenced. And we're back on board with the New World Order. Institutionally, this country is following the dictates of the papacy. Right down to your local school boards. Right down to your local city councils. Right down to your local Masonic Lodge. Thus the Pope is made the last, final, and only judge in everything. He is the tribunal of last resort upon every question he shall undertake to decide. He is infallible whenever he shall decide and whenever he declares himself to be so. Whatsoever he commands in the vast domain embraced by his jurisdiction, which he alone sets, has infallibility instantaneously attached to it. Whatsoever he shall announce in reference to the Roman Catholic Church, its history, its faith, its, in, its, dis, its discipline, its rules of ethics, its requirements of its members, its demands upon the world, its rights, its authorities, his own power, and that of his hierarchy in all the nations, all this becomes absolute truth and must be accepted and obeyed as such. There must be no doubting, no hesitation, no inquiry, no resort to reason for either to doubt or to hesitate or to inquire or to appeal to reason is heresy. The most accredited books of history must be closed. The papacy and the civil power by R.W. Thompson must be closed. The mind must be shut up so that a, no, not a single ray of light can penetrate it. The reason must be, uh, the reason, that is, the, re the, the ability of a man's mind to reason must be stifled by closing every avenue of access to it. The whole man must be subjugated. Everything must be surrendered to the Pope because it is impossible for him to err. Because, quote, the church itself is the divine witness, the teacher, and judge of the revolution of, of the revelation entrusted to it, unquote. Because no human power, quote, can revise or criticize or test her teachings, that is the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, because the pastors of the church with their head, that is the Pope, are a witness divinely sustained and guided to guard and to declare the faith, unquote because these obtained their testimony, quote, not in human history, but in apostolic tradition, in scripture, in creeds, in liturgy, in the public worship and law of the church, in councils, and in the interpretation of all these things by the supreme authority of the Roman Catholic Church, unquote. That is, the Pope 
and because the Church, through the Pope, quote, can alone determine the extent of its own infallibility, unquote. I mean, after all, if you're infallible, then you can determine the extent or limits of that infallibility, and you can do it infallibly, right? <laughs> Are you confused? Well, confusion defines this modern age. Let's just put it plainly. Whenever the Pope speaks, you must obey. Because he has the infallible use of coercive power. And he's got control of your government. And your tax dollars, for as long as this country has been available, uh, or has been on the earth, has taxed its people and has perfected its technologies so that it can coerce you to do anything. And I hear all this talk on amateur radio about uh, all these uh, so-called Christians are uh, arming themselves, buying guns. Do you think those little pea shooters are going to amount to a whit when you come across the most powerful military coercive force the world has ever seen, the U.S. military, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. armed forces, the civil power of the papacy in this country? That's right. You worked all your life and paid all your taxes to give the Pope the power to turn you to toast at the flick of a switch or to just erase your bank account with a stroke of a keyboard. Who can make war with the Pope? That's right. Our civil institutions, once Protestant, are now Catholic. They are at the Pope's disposal. R.W. Thompson warned about this day. And American Protestants failed to heed the warning. And the ecumenical movement, the success of the ecumenical movement to reunite the Protestants back into the Roman Catholic Church is proof that there's no real concept in this country of the aims of the papacy for controlling the world. Not to mention the United States of America. There's no comprehension in my experience, both on Inquisition Update and on Amateur Radio, is nobody wants to know. And certainly, if they begin to comprehend this, Nobody wants to talk about it. And worse than all, nobody wants to do anything about it. That's what the Pope meant by unquestioning obedience. Unquestioning submission. He got what he wanted. And now all the power can be directed at silencing those rare few who scream bloody murder to wake up God's people. To silence whatever minor opposition there might be. And let me tell you, they're very artful in their ability to silence a truth teller. Look what they did to Jeremiah. It still happens today. Now, Archbishop Manning is beyond all question a man of imminent ability, far too sagacious not to see the results which must logically follow these papal doctrines, this absorption of all power within the illumin Ill Ill illimitable domain of faith and morals by an infallible pope. And therefore, observing the present condition of the Christian world and seeing the nations hitherto Roman Catholic gradually conceding to the people more political rights than they ever enjoyed before, and witnessing the fact that the Roman Catholic people of Italy have solemnly decided whether wonder, with a wonderful unanimity that the Pope shall be king of Rome no longer but a mere bishop of the church, he breaks out in these doleful words, quote, 
But what security has the Christian world? Without helm, chart, or light, it has launched itself into the falls of revolution. There's not a monarchy that is not threatened. In Spain and France, monarchy is already overthrown. The hated syllabus will have its justification. The syllabus which con condemned atheism and revolution would have saved society. But men would not. That's right. At the time of the writing of this book in 1876, at the time of the writing of... Pope Pius IX encyclical and syllabus of error, the whole world was rejecting the papacy and demanding that he not be king. That if he was to be anything in this world, he was to just be a bishop like all other bishops. And these were Roman Catholic countries, hitherto ruled lock, stock, and barrel by the papacy. Their kings were crowned by the papacy. Their crowns were removed by the papacy. They all swooned at his feet, did his bidding in the world. But now they all rejected him. Everywhere in the world except... Protestant USA. Did anybody ever tell you this before? It was the Roman Catholic nations of Europe that overthrew the temporal power of the Pope. They were sick and tired of the tyrant of Rome. Many of them even had the courage to call him Antichrist. At the time when the papacy seemed dead, there was absolutely no strength left in the Pope to, to, to persecute anyone. He had to resort to begging, begging anybody to obey him and give him, give him back what he so blasphemously er arrogated to himself, the divine right to rule. The papacy was reduced to beggary. But not here in the United States. Not here in Protestant USA. He said, I am Pope nowhere in the world but in the United States of America. Isn't it amazing? He said the syllabus of error would have saved the world. But men would not. Men wouldn't accept the syllabus of error. They rebelled against Pope Pius IX. They put him in his place. He was a prisoner of his own Vatican walls. He didn't have a voice anymore. Anywhere in the world except in the United States of America. It continues, he says, they are dissolving the temporal power of the vicar of Christ. And why do they dissolve it? So says the Pope. Listen to what he says. Because governments are no longer Christian. Governments are no longer Christian. That's right. A government that stands up and says, Pope, go home. We have Christ we don't need Antichrist. We'll govern ourselves according to the Scriptures. The Pope says those governments are no longer Christian. See where we're headed with this ecumenical movement to unite with the Roman Catholic Church? If you're going to have a Christian government, it must obey the Pope unquestioningly. Is that what you want? See you next time on Inquisition Update.